And welcome to worship on this Transfiguration Sunday. We want to draw your attention to the fact that we now have an insert in our bulletin. This lovely yellow page. And so what we're trying to do is decrease the amount of details that are kind of... So we'll just be putting those in our insert. And there's also general information so that when we have visitors, they can follow along with what's going on in the service. I also want to draw your attention to the two red roses on our table this morning in honor of the birth in our church community. The twin sons of James and Natalie Robinson Alaskas, Jacob Robert and Spencer Thomas, born on 
February 19 this week. So we give thanks for life in our community. These are the grandchildren of Tom and Carol Robinson. This week is Ash Wednesday. Um, March 2nd is Ash Wednesday. And so in lieu of a formal service, we will be providing an imposition of ashes in the courtyard at noon. And then the sanctuary will be open for reflection with organist um, and our new music director, Tim Leon. That will be from 12 until 1230. We also will be using a sanctified arts resources for Lent, the series called Full to the Brim. We'll use those for our services on Sunday morning. And then on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m., we will have a Bible study every week throughout Lent, except for Ash Wednesday. In our offering this morning, we encourage you to write a thank you note to Kevin Maloney, who provided music for us from in January and February. He was able to quickly fill in for us once Daniel moved out of the country. And so he was, it was helpful to have someone who was just consistent here every week. And we didn't have to go finding a sub from week to week. So we um, want to give our gratitude to Kevin. And finally, our flame of unity this week is with Calvary Wilmington and Iglesia Agape. So this week we want to lift and hold Calgary Wilmington in our prayers. In sacred places of our homes and in the sanctuary, we welcome. Whether you are worshiping today or in the future on our YouTube channel, we gather. From all directions, from urban, suburban, and rural locations, we connect. Listen to him, our God cries from the mountaintop. It is good for us to be here. We bow, bow before, before our God, God and, and worship. worship. May God's word sink into our ears. May our hearts be transfigured, our minds filled with understanding. Friends, the sun has risen and Christ, and Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.
calls us to faithfulness, yet we so often fall short. Let us approach our God of grace with sincere confession and contrite hearts. Creator of all, you speak, but we fail to listen. You guide, but we fail to follow. You move, but we remain stuck and stagnant in the same patterns of destruction and sin. Free us from our failures, holy God. Save us from ourselves so we can hear and heed your call. Amen. Happy are those whose trans transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Friends, be happy, be free, for our sins in Jesus Christ have been forgiven. Amen. And as forgiven of free and free people, we pass the peace of Christ to our friends, our neighbors, and the pews around us in whatever way you feel safe this morning. Peace be with you, also with you. With you over here. Never catch Pam in the corner. Peace be with you, Pam. Please join me in prayer this morning, our prayer for illumination. Holy God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Listen for God's word for you this morning. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to a mountaintop to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then the cloud, from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our story this morning for the children at home is called Telephone. Tell Peter fly home for dinner. Tell Peter hit pot flies and homers. <laughs> Tell Peter prop planes are for flyers. Tell Peter Put your wet socks in the dryer. Tell Peter rock stars are admired. 
Tell Peter crocodiles are bad liars. Tell Peter lobsters are good hiders. Tell Peter my monster truck has big tires. Tell Peter I'm too high up on this wire. Tell Peter something smells like fire. Tell Peter there's a giant monster lobster named Homer. He smells like socks and he breathes red fire. His eyes blaze like stars and he rides a crocodile that flies and he's coming to this wire. Tell Peter to fly, fly far, far away. He's too young to be somebody's dinner. That owl doesn't look too convinced of what he heard. Hey, Peter. Your mom says fly home for dinner. We did a little experiment in our house this week. We tried playing that game of telephone for the first time. I wanted to see if the simple declaration of who Jesus is from today's story about the transfiguration could get across from one adult through three four-year-olds to another adult. In our first version of this game, we whispered into the ear of the person next to us and down the line and down the line. I tried to whisper as clearly as possible. This is my son, my chosen. At the line, it had just become some hushing sounds and no real words. So then we tried putting each person in a different room of the house and we would go from one person to the next to say the phrase, out loud. And, and by the end, end we got, got these. So Zen. And Son Addison. And then we, and then we heard, heard, this is my son from Frozen. Frozen. This is what made sense to children who have seen the Disney movie Frozen about a hundred times. They filled in the gaps of what they couldn't understand with something familiar, something they knew. We did eventually successfully relay the message, though, this is my son, my chosen. At the point in which the transfiguration of Christ occurs on a mountaintop, the people of Galilee had some conjectures of who they thought Jesus was. They knew some facts they had seen or heard rumors of his teachings and healings. This early game of telephone gives us this that Jesus was Joseph's son. We read this in Luke chapters three and four. Some people were present then at the birth and so they knew this firsthand. Some people wondered if Jesus was a prophet. We read this in Luke seven and nine. According to Luke four, seven and nine, people came to Jesus as a teacher and Luke, and Luke tells us in chapters 4 and 6 that Jesus is a healer and an exorcist. These are all positive or perhaps neutral descriptions of Jesus, depending on where you're sitting in life. Then there's the negative ones, the ones that then led to Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. He is a blasphemer in Luke 5, a friend of sinners and tax collectors. Luke 7. Although today one would argue that these aspects of who Jesus was are incredibly central to Christianity. 
Even John the Baptist questions the true identity of Christ early on in Christ's ministry. He sends two of his own disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the one who is to come? Or are we to wait for another? Luke 7. Rather than giving them a direct answer, Jesus tells them to go back to John and tell John what they have seen Jesus do. The disciples Peter, James, and John got to hear and see who God says Jesus is directly. We can say that they are the first receivers of this message in the Christian game of telephone. Jesus invited them to a mountaintop with him to pray. And while they were praying, they witnessed the transfiguration. Listen again to how Luke describes it. While Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Peter then decided that they should sort of document or memorialize this event by making a dwelling for Jesus and Moses and Elijah in that place. And while he pitched this idea to Jesus, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, Moses and Elijah had disappeared, and Jesus stood alone. In awe of witnessing this moment, this revelation, Peter, James, and John kept silent and told no one of what they had seen and heard. Whereas throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus instructs his disciples to tell no one what they see or what they've heard Jesus do, here on the mountaintop, these three disciples decided to keep this mysterious, beautiful, and awesome event to themselves. They were terrified. In a good way, one would presume, they were stunned by what had happened. They told no one. Because how could they? What could they say? How could they describe this experience? Would anyone believe them? Did they even understand it? Do we understand it? There's something to be said of taking some time to contemplate this experience, to discuss together, perhaps, what this may have meant. But we know that this message, that Jesus is God's Son, God's Chosen, eventually made its way down the line, whether Peter, James, and John said it directly to someone or not. In an interview that was posted on the Instagram page of The Verge, Keanu Reeves tells of a conversation he had with the teenage children of a Hollywood director at a dinner party. These three teenagers had not seen the movie The Matrix, and Keanu tried to explain the movie to them. It's about this guy who's in this alternate reality but doesn't know if it's an alternate reality or what's real and what's not. One of the teenagers asked, why? Why what, Keanu asks. Why does it matter, she responds. Why does it matter whether this character experienced what was real or not, or what it meant or not, or whether he would be able to explain it to other people or not? The person conducting this interview says, that's wild, isn't it? It's awesome, Keanu responds. It's awesome to think that this young person didn't think it would be important to explain why an experience was real or not, but rather it's important just to relish in the experience itself, to wonder in the mystery. There's mystery and wonder that didn't need to be explained. Can we sit in that wonder, in that mystery, of what happened on that mountaintop and not try to explain it? Not try to explain the mystery of how the message got delivered, but just appreciate that it did get delivered. And because of what we have 
because of that, that it had been delivered, we have been given the privilege of passing that message along. Can we try not to project why God may have used such an odd but spectacularly awesome way to tell these three disciples that Jesus is God's son, that Jesus is chosen? Can we imagine that experience and just let it be what it is? A light shining around Jesus. Jesus appearing with Moses and Elijah and they're talking who knows what about. And then suddenly they're gone and it's just Jesus and the disciples in a cloud. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could just let go of trying to completely explain and understand this seemingly magical moment and just accept that there's some mystery in this moment? Can we just accept that some theological concepts like the Trinity or how Mary actually became pregnant with Jesus or how Jesus did actually rise from the dead are difficult to explain? But perhaps we don't need to explain it, that perhaps we just need to believe it and pass along the message. Pass it along clearly so that it's not misheard. So that out of the way, let's set the mystery of the transfiguration aside and let's look back at the message of who Jesus is. Let's look back at some theology from our own tradition that has reflected on God's declaration that Jesus is God's son, God's chosen. In the Presbyterian tradition, our constitution consists of two parts. The book of order, all the stuff about who we, how we do who we are and how we govern who we are. And the book of confessions, which is all the stuff about who we are, what we believe. We believe that the church is reformed and always reforming, and as such, we have added to this book of confessions rather than replacing them over the centuries. We believe that God has worked in and through Christians in specific times and locations and contexts, and as such, there is something to be said of truth, and there is something to be said of what Christians have come to believe in each of these contexts that we believe as Presbyterians we can benefit from, and so we put it in our constitution. And we believe that our book of confessions will never be complete. There's a professor, Ken Sawyer, at the Cormac Theological Presbytery. He's Presbyterian Seminary. He's a professor of Christian history, and he encourages his students to rip off the back cover of their book of confessions. This is easier to do if your copy is soft cover rather than hard cover. I have a deep respect for books, and so this was very hard for me to do, but the symbolism of the action was more important than the integrity of the binding. Luckily that I did that though, because I purchased my copy before the PCUSA adopted the Belhar Confession. So I should probably just staple that on the back. In prayerfully discerning what to include in the book of confessions, what to expound upon about who Jesus is, about who God says Jesus is, about who God, about who Jesus is based on what he did on earth and in the fact that he was resurrected and ascended into heaven and goes to prepare a place for us, what have the people of our tradition confessed about who Jesus is? So here we go. From the Apostles' Creed of the early church, Jesus Christ is God's only Son, our Lord. From the Nicene Creed of the fourth century, Jesus is Lord, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. From the Scots Confession, written in the 16th century, God, Jesus is God incarnate, Jesus is God's son, and as such, is our brother. From the Heidelberg Catechism, also written in the 16th century, Jesus Christ is our faithful savior, and as such, is our only comfort in life and in death. 
Jesus is the son of God, called the Christ, the anointed one. From the second Helvetic confession of the 16th century, Christ is true God and Christ is true man. Christ is truly risen from the dead and truly ascended into heaven. Jesus Christ is the only savior of the world and the true awaited Messiah. From the Westminster Confession of the 17th century, Lord Jesus, God's only begotten son, who is mediator between God and us. And from the catechisms then of that Westminster Confession, Jesus is the son of God and redeemer of God's elect. From the, the theological declaration of Mar Barman in 20th century, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is the one word of God, God's assurance that we are forgiven from all our sins. From the confession of 1967, the risen Christ is the savior and judge of us all. Two more. From the statement, the brief statement of faith, Adopted in 1990, we trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. And from the Belhar Confession, written in South Africa in 1982, adopted into our book of confessions in 2016, simply stated, Jesus is Lord. The message in our game of telephone, from Christian to Christian, throughout the centuries has been main, remained quite clear. And so today in the 21st century, in this specific time and place, in this specific congregation, who do we say Jesus is? The message has gotten all the way down to us. I think I just heard a couple people say it. From the time being, for the time being, we are the end of that telephone line and we proudly and boldly proclaim that Jesus is God's son, God's chosen. From the transfiguration to us today, Jesus is God's son, God's chosen. Alleluia. Amen and amen.
Please join me in the affirmation of faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. If we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. God calls us to live lives of grateful generosity. Let us praise the giver of all good gifts through our offering today. We invite you to bring your offerings forward as well as any thank you cards that you have written to Kevin Maloney. God of grace, you provide for us in amazing ways. Accept these offerings as signs of our gratitude and bless them to further Christ's ministry and mission among the poor, the despairing, and the destitute. Amen. As we go to prayer this morning, I invite our friends on Zoom to write prayer requests in the chat as I read off some prayer requests here from the sanctuary, starting with gratitude that this candle has made it. Um, <laughs> I bought some new candles and I think I used the wrong new candle. Prayers for Louise Escoffrey. For the family of Nancy. For the people of Ukraine and Russia, peace for all people. For Kelly, prayers for Juan as he starts rehab for drugs and mental illness issues coming up on Tuesday. Prayers for healing for Maria after losing her mother. And prayers for healing for Elsie, Scott, and Daryl. 
Do we have prayer requests from Zoom? Yes, uh, from Marty, prayers for his friend Ken, who is going through chemotherapy, and from Jim Rack, prayers for his brother. Let us pray. O oh God, do not keep silent. Do not hide yourself from us. Turn your face towards us in this time of prayer that we might hear you well and discern your will for our lives. Your glory is revealed, dearest God, through this mountaintop moment of worship. We bask in the glow of your presence through word and worship, through prayers, hymns, and liturgy. You remind us of your promises here, promises of a world redeemed and restored, promises of hope for justice and peace for all. We soak up your light. We radiate your love. Like Moses, we come down from our mountaintop time and in your presence, shining like stars in the night sky, ready to reflect your beauty to the world. God of our salvation, you cry out to us from today's scripture. You command us to listen to your son, your chosen. Jesus has a good word for us today and every day. Yet too often we fail to listen or interpret his words into what we want to hear, not what we should. Enlarge our capacity to understand, holy God. Let Jesus' words sink into our ears and direct our lives. Transfigure us today, holy God, so that we can faithfully carry out Christ's ministry. Wellspring of life, the sabers of war are rattling. Militarism and violence are preferred means to our greedy ends. Protect the innocent, holy God, caught between warring powers. Shelter the poor and the suffering, stymie the powerful and privileged, heal the wounds within us that breed conflict and neglect the necessary work of peace. United as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers to you, Savior God, hear us now, as we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, open your ears to God's chosen. Open your mind to understanding and open your hearts to transfiguration. And may you go from this place knowing that you are loved and beloved. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.